A very good morning and you're very welcome to this morning's signpost webinar. My name is Mark Gibson and I'm head of the Chagas KT Outreach and Innovation Department and I'm joined by Pat Murphy who is head of the Chagas Environment Knowledge Transfer Programme. Good morning Pat. Good morning. Um, and I'll introduce our other speakers in just a moment, uh, but just to remind you that this series is brought to you by Chagas in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network and Food Drink Ireland. So today we're going to speak about the Farm Zero project, which is a collaboration between Biorbic, Carberry and others to create an economically viable climate neutral dairy farm. And to tell us more about the Zero C project, we're joined by Kean White, who's an ecologist with Trinity College Dublin, and Gavin Hunt, who is the project manager of the Farm Zero project. Gentlemen, you're very welcome to the Signpost webinar. Thanks, Mark. So um, I know you're going to tell us about the, the project itself in the, the presentation, but maybe you could just give us a little bit of background to your own, your own background. Uh, Gavin, maybe starting with you. Yeah, Mark. Um, my name is Gavin Hunt. So I'm the project manager at the Farm Zero C. So I'm usually based in Schnock in West Cork. So I'm working with Bioarvig, which is a bioeconomy um, research centre. So based in UCD. So I'm actually working in the offices in UCD today. So I'm broadcasting from Dublin. Very good. And the project is a collaboration with Carberry. Um, for anybody who doesn't know who Carberry is, it's a major dairy co-op. Uh, based in Ireland and, and across the, the globe, I suppose, at this stage. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. 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 Very good. And Cian, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? So I'm a PhD student, just about to finish up, in, based in Trinity College Dublin. I'm uh, in the botany department. And my supervisor is Jane Stout, so she does a lot of work on pollinators. Uh, she would have set up the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan. And she also has done a lot of work on natural capital counting. So we're kind of bringing that... An approach to farm zero C, doing a lot of habitat mapping and then trying to build natural capital accounts of farm scale on these intensive dairy farms to see if they can be integrated into the kind of farming management plans and system. Great, great. Okay, so it's a holistic approach that, uh, that the project is taking. Okay, so um, Gavin, I think you're going to start with the presentation. And uh, so we've got two separate presentations. So if you could share your screen with us, Gavin. And um, just to remind everybody that today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Chagas website along with the um, along with the, the slides from today. And you can also catch up on any of the previous webinars through our signpost podcast. So if you're driving in your car, your tractor, wherever you might be, you can tune in and listen to uh, uh, previous uh, versions of the Chagas signpost series. So, Gavin, we'll hand over to you and um, we will. Just to remind everybody as well, of course, uh, do send us your questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. So we'll hand over to you, Gavin. Perfect. Thanks, Mark. Can you see that? Yes. Yes, that's perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I just want to start by giving a small bit of background to the project and why it was started. Um, I suppose Irish dairy farmers are suffering from environmental and market pressures, with farmers bearing the brunt of the pressures on their sector. There has been a lot of media attention um, in the sector recently in relation to climate action bills and sectoral targets. So we are in a good starting position as the carbon footprint of Irish milk is one of the lowest in the world. Speaking to farmers on the ground as part of the project, they understand changes needed and are keen to adopt new technologies to reduce the environmental footprint. The Farm Zero Seed project team are keen to help farmers achieve these goals. What's the project about? Farm Zero Seed is a collaboration between Biorbic, Carberry and others to create an economically viable climate neutral dairy farm. The project presents a holistic approach to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase the health and resilience of the farm. We're aiming to achieve net zero emissions by 2027, but we also look at areas such as biodiversity, air quality and water quality. Farm Zero C will be a beacon for sustainable agriculture and provide a bright future for farmers and rural communities. Who are we collaborating with? So we're looking to collaborate with some fantastic people from different organisations. Kevin O'Connor from Biorbic and in the Buckley from Carberry are leading the project. We have Jane Stout and Keen Moy from Trinity College Dublin, James Gaffey and Pat Doody from MTU, Fanula Murphy and Alejandro Vergara from UCD, Johan Sanders from Grassa, Lauren Shlu and Bridget Lynch from Chagas. And we're also working with technology partners such as Carbon Space and Carbon Harvesters. Just to give a small bit of background on Schnack Farm, where the project is taking place, it is situated in Urbanda in the West Cork. So Schnock Farm is a working dairy farm, making about 250 cows in approximately 250 acres. 
It was set up in 2011 as part of, as part of the joint programme between Chagas and Cavalry, and is owned by the four West Cork co-ops, Bandon, Bayro, Drina and Isavard. The aim of the joint programme is to demonstrate the design, set up and operation of a large scale dairy unit, a grass based system to provide information on the profitability and sustainability of this type of farming system. Schnock is a well managed profitable farm, which we've seen in the figures from 2020. So you're looking at a stocking rate of just about a cow to the acre. Grass grown in 2020 was about 13.23 tonnes of dry matter per hectare, utilizing, utilizing nearly 11 tonnes at 10.9, six week calving rate 91%, empty rate 9.2%. Mean calving date in 19th of February, producing just over 1,100 kgs of milk solids per hectare. So the focus of Schnack Farm has now pivoted as part of the project. We have six key pillars in the project. So animal diet and breeding, soil and soil carbon, renewable energy, biodiversity, clover and clover multi-species swords and life cycle analysis. Looking at the breakdown of our carbon footprint in the farm, um, about 63% is from animal, animal digestion, 13% coming from manure storage, spreading and grazing, 17% coming from fertilizer use, 5% from forage and feed production, about 2% from other sources. When we're talking about specific greenhouse gases, similar to all livestock systems, methane is our biggest concern, but about half, over half our carbon footprint coming from enteric fermentation, and methane, has, methane from manure storage accounts for approximately 7% of our emissions. Nitrous oxide is the second largest contributor, with emissions coming from spreading fertilizer, slurry management, and grazing livestock. Carbon dioxide is the smallest contributor on the farm, with emissions coming from burning fossil fuels, electricity, and the production of concentrate and fertilizer. Looking at our life cycle analysis, our carbon footprint is displayed in terms of kgs or CO2 equivalents per kg of fat and protein corrected milk. So start note in 2018, our carbon footprint was 0 0.95. In 2019, this was reduced to 0 0.87, and our most recent figure in 2020 is 0 0.78. So there's been a significant reduction um, in the carbon footprint since 2018. And if we're looking at the Chagas models, the average Irish figure is just under one. Um, most recent figures are 0 0.99 kgs of CO2 equivalent per kg of fat and protein corrected milk. So the farm is very efficient, which is credit to farm manager Kevin Horn and 2AC Alan Murphy. How have we reduced our carbon footprint since 2018? So I'm just going to list some of the greenhouse gas mitigation me measures that are implemented on the farm. We are incorporating clover into swards to reduce our chemical nitrogen usage. The aim is to reduce chemical in to an average of about 150 kgs per hectare. We were using low emission slurry spreading on the farm since 2020. So the less system is increasing the end fertilizer value of the slurry, allowing us to reduce total chemical in, and is also having the added benefit of reducing ammonia emissions of up to 30%. We're using the economic breeding index to improve milk solids production, fertility and health, and to maximize profitability and environmental sustainability. The EBI of the Schnack herd is the top 5% nationally. We're using protected urea since 2020 to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It has approximately about 71% lower nitrous oxide emissions compared to calcium ammonium nitrate can. Grass and management is excellent in the farm, averaging about 14 tonne of dry matter per hectare over the last number of years. And the targets to enter covers about 13, 1400 kgs of dry matter per hectare over the main grazing season and achieved 280 days of grass. A wind turbine was installed in Schnock in 2011 and supplies approximately 30% of the farm's energy requirements. This slide shows our holistic approach that we're taking. So what will we will be doing as part of Farm ZRC? Um, as I said, a holistic approach, looking at animal and manure emissions, land, soil and import emissions, off-farm social and technological impact and biodiversity strategies. We're looking at the diet to reduce methane production. So we're working very closely with Lauren Schlu and Moorpark to look at grass press, the grass press cake from the biorefinery, um, multi-species and methane reducing additives. We're aiming to improve animal health through improved management practices and using the EBI to improve the health of index of the herd. We're testing slurry amendments to reduce the greenhouse gas from stored slurry. We're also looking at quantifying emissions for underground and also using satellite imagery. We plan to use um, stabilized slurry and also have a trial in place on the farm, um, approximately 0 0.4 of a hectare um, with biochar and seaweed to displace fertilizer use. So that's at the early stages. We're using clover and multi-species sward to reduce fertilizer use also. Approximately 10% of the farm is currently in the multi-species mix. 
We're using, as I mentioned, protected urea to reduce nit nitrous oxide emissions. We're also looking at alternative protein feeds and looking at ways to create an all-native concentrate to feed the cows in the parlour. We're looking at ways to increase soil carbon se sequestration in the farm. Renewable energy is a key pillar in the project. So we're installing solar PV in the roof of the milking parlour to combine with the wind turbine that is already in place. Um, we're also looking at using a grass protein concentrate from the grass boiling refinery to reduce intensive import emissions in monogastric diets. Um, looking at off-farm, we're looking at the demand for climate traceable products. We're looking at developing an innovation blueprint, so a business plan to increase the resilience of farm. Um, and looking at the biodiversity strategies, which Keen will um, go into in more detail later. So we're looking to increase biodiversity and the creation of national, a national, natural capital account. We're also looking at satellite imagery used for ha habitat ma mapping. So it's quite a complex site. It kind of just gives an overview of our holistic approach. As you can see from the bottom right, we're looking to achieve neutral or climate neutrality by 2027. There has been a lot of um, interest in the multi-species ward. Um, so everybody that's visiting the farm wants, wants to see the multi-species ward in, in action. So I just have attached a couple of photos. The first photo on the left is just before the cows go into it. Middle photo, cows grazing it. And, and photo on the right um, is the post-grazing residue. So as you can see, there's no issue um, with cows grazing out and they're grazing out tight. And approximately 10% of the farm is in this mixture as well. So it's a mixture of chicory, plantain, perennial ryegrass, um, white clover, and red clover. Soil carbon sequestration is getting a lot of attention in the media recently. So I just have a short slide explaining what we're doing in Chinook. So we're monitoring and verifying soil carbon sequestration will take us further to prove negative emissions on the farm. Soil carbon sequestration is not part of the IPCC network framework at the moment. So we need to prove what we're basically need to prove what we're sequestering in Chinook. So how we will measure sequestration. We need to analyze satellite data from Chinook. We need to monitor soil carbon stocks through soil sampling. We need to quantify real-time greenhouse gas fluxes and meteorological variables using a sea flux tower. So it's going to be quite difficult and it will take time to verify the amount of carbon sequestered in the soil. So we have established a Chinook baseline and we now mitigate, sample and sense so we can work towards certification of carbon sequestration in farms. Such an approach will also drive organic practices to increase the cut of the soil carbon sequestration rate. So just my last slide, just the conclusion. So we're placing the farm at the center of the solution. So we're hoping to build the solution, the solution foundation that can be rolled out rapidly to farmers. The aim is to transform agriculture and provide a bright future for farmers and rural communities. We want to exceed EU targets for 2030 and 2050. And Farms ERC will be a beacon for sustainable agriculture globally. I might just hand over to you now, Keen. Thanks, Gavin. So we'll just uh, get you set up there, Keen. And just to remind everybody while Keen is setting up there that um, next week is uh, Bioeconomy Week Ireland, and today's presentation and next week's presentation uh, are part of the, the series of activities taking place as part of Bioeconomy Ireland Week. So we, we'll share some more details with you about that next week or after. Keen's presentation. So Keen, we'll hand, hand over to you. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk much more about the kind of biodiversity piece of the project. Gavin's given an overview of the whole structure. There's a lot going on in the projects, but I'm just going to talk specifically today about farmland habitat mapping and how that kind of fits in with what we're doing on the ground in Chinook on our 10 replicator farms. There's also a natural capital piece to the work package I'm in. I'm in. So we're trying to create natural capital accounts at the farm scale. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today. But if you want more uh, an idea of what natural capital is and how we might create natural capital accounts at the farm scale, um, my supervisor, Jane Stout, gave a presentation to this signpost series last year. Uh, so I'd recommend checking that out. Then we've actually created accounts uh, probably by next year, maybe next year and a half. I can come back and talk about it probably then. But we haven't made a huge amount of progress on that yet. So today I'm going to talk about farmland habitat mapping. And just, I'm going to want to first of all give you context for kind of at the EU policy level, what's going on there. There's a lot of movement uh, because there's this EU Green Deal has kind of come in in the last year or two. And so, with the EU Green Deal, there's a whole lot of policies that are kind of coming in that are changing how uh, farmland or kind of just biodiversity and kind of agricultural agri environment schemes are, are changing at, at the European level. 
Um, so this Fire and Fork strategy is integrating into this the new CAP reform and the EU biodiversity strategy is also integrating into this new CAP. Um, so when each member state creates its the new form of the CAP is that each member state has to create its own strategic plan, common agricultural strategic plan. So this means that Ireland is, is at the moment creating, the Department of Agriculture is creating its own uh, common agricultural policy for Ireland, uh, so specific to Ireland. Um, but when they are creating that, uh, they have to look at these EU level objectives. Um, so the specific objectives around the CAP, but then there's these new EU Green Deal objectives that the Department of Agriculture have to look at and then integrate into their own strategic plan for Ireland. Um, so these Green Deal objectives come from this farm fork strategy and this EU biodiversity strategy. So just going to pull out a few of these targets here. This is not an exhaustive list, but just a few that will impact uh, Irish agriculture. So they're looking for 25% of agricultural land to be organic. This is now across the EU. Uh, and then another one is reduce nutrients by 50%, reduce nutrient losses by 50%, and uh, reduce over fertilizer, overall fertilizer use by 20%. So we'll be looking at that uh, in kind of the life cycle assessment analysis within the project. But as I'm the ecologist on the project, I'm more interested in this 10% uh, agricultural area under high diversity landscape features. Um, and so, you know, that's when farmers, when I talk to farmers about these new EU green deal targets, uh, and specifically about this 10% habitat area. Um, they ask me, like, why, why is this happening? That seems like quite an onerous task, uh, especially if it's into a, a farm scale. Um, so I just want to give the, the background to why the EU biodiversity strategy has this 10% target and then why it's been implemented into the common agricultural policy uh, currently. So the reason it's in this biodiversity strategy uh, is because but the EU biodiversity strategy is, is a response to the EU's uh, State of Nature report, 2020 State of Nature report. Um, and that report um, wasn't so encouraging. Uh, this, this is the kind of map of the kind of most valuable habitats across the EU. These are the Nature 2000 habitats, the Habitats Directive habitats. And you can see in Ireland, uh, you know, most of our habitats are in a poor or bad condition. Uh, and then there's also a lot of deterioration going on. Um, so the trends aren't great either. Um, so a lot of Ireland is there, is purple as well. And just in comparison to other countries, here's Ireland, and over 80% of our nature of thousand habitats are in a poor condition. And unfortunately, it is agriculture is the most frequently reported pressure for habitats and species. And the reason for this is two things, there's abandonment. So at either end of the intensification scale, there's, there's an issue. There's abandonment of grasslands. So you can imagine if a lot of the farmers in the burn were to stop managing their kind of extensive pastures, they'd lose a lot of that really species rich habitat. And that would be an issue. That would be a loss of important habitat. And then at the other end is this intensification where you, you lose kind of natural grasslands and a lot of landscape features within an intensive, say, a dairying, dairying system. Um, so these two either ends of the spectrum are what are contributing to kind of biodiversity decline. And just to give you more information on, on kind of pop, kind of species level information, uh, this is EU birds uh, population index from 1990 to the present day. And the graph on the left is the farmland birds, and you can see they've declined by about 30%, whereas the forest birds on the right haven't declined at all. And a similar story is for grassland butterflies, and this kind of reflects the trend for all kind of grassland pollinator species. Um, you know, over the last 30 years, they've declined by about 40%. So, and this is a, a result of intensification of agriculture. So when the EU policymakers, the kind of ecologists are looking at this trend, they're trying to, how do we, how do we try and integrate uh, kind of biodiversity policy into agricultural systems to mitigate these trends? And that's where they come up with this 10% area target in, in agriculture. So that's the background to why this is happening. Um, and then I want, so yeah, that's, this is why it's been integrated into Green Deal. Um, we haven't had kind of these integration of, of common agriculture scale before. Um, so it's kind of a new landscape, policy landscape that's happened recently. Um, Chagas have been, you know, uh, on the foot, uh, uh, been, you know, ambitious about this, and they've integrated this, these targets already into their signpost program. So you can see here for biodiversity, they have, you know, they have a target to reach 10% of high biodiversity value area per farm. Um, so that's great, great, and I'm one hundred percent trying to do that. So we're going to try and do that on our at our demonstrator farm in Shinnock and also at our on our ten replicator farms. 
So if you were to try and implement this, this, this target, this 10% habit, agricultural area under biodiversity landscape features, you have to do some kind of habitat mapping. And the traditional way you would do habitat mapping is to employ an ecologist like myself to go out and actually you know, do a habitat map on the farm. However, that's a very you know, onerous task, takes a lot of time and effort. So a, a better way to do it would be to use kind of remote sensing technology such as satellites uh, to map farmland habitat. The current standard, the one that's kind of across, uh, uh, labeled across Europe is this uh, Copernicus land cover map. Um, and it's not very useful. So this is Shinnok Farm, and you can see it's just mostly uh, agricultural land and it picks out a few buildings. So that you couldn't, you can't use this to measure this 10% agricultural area uh, under high diversity landscape features. And Ireland have not yet opted to use satellite based waves to major capital implementation. And it's largely because uh, you know, the satellites just weren't capable yet of picking up uh, uh, these kind of features with, during the last cap formation. Um, but that's changed and it's changing recently because of new technologies and new satellites being released. So what is possible? Well, this is what happens when I go out and actually survey Shinnok on the ground. So this is, again, this is a habitat map of Shinnok and you can really see all the different habitat types and the hedgerows and different forestry areas. Uh, it's just much more resolved that you can actually measure what is the percentage area of habitat on the farm. So with Farm Zero C, what we're gonna do is just take four or five different uh, satellites available through the European Space Agency and apply machine learning techniques to try and create habitat maps and can compare them to the on the ground habitat maps that we've gone out and actually mapped on the farm. So it's a kind of compare and contrast technique. What is the cost benefit analysis to? How, how much would it cost to actually implement this kind of satellite based habitat mapping system? Is it possible to use habitat maps to measure this 10% target is, is the question we're trying to, trying to answer. Um, so that's, that's kind of the first task within the project that, that I will be doing. Um, and there is a, so I have said that Ireland hasn't yet opted to use satellite-based ways to measure capital implementation, but there's a revolution going on in Ireland currently around habitat mapping. So this is, there is this national habitat map to be released soon. Um, this is a whole, there's a whole working group created around this and it's to be released in the next few months. And it looks very good. Uh, you know, like they're picking out, uh, improved grassland, scrub, tree lines, even semi-natural grassland within a field. Uh, and hedgerows. So this is obviously very useful. This is going to be a revolution, genuinely, in habitat mapping in Ireland. So this could serve as the baseline for you know what is the farm scale habitat cover. However, the issue is that it's only you know the reference year for this date is 2018. So what what happened was the OSI employed a, 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 a aerial imagery, so they flew a plane around the whole country imaging it at high resolution. So. We're likely to get maybe another one or two uh, iterations of the habitat, national habitat map coming up to 2030. So we'll be able to see changes every you know, what, four or five years. And you know, is that enough to actually monitor progress towards this 10% target? Yes, but in large jumps every you know, five years, every maybe four years. And it's gonna be difficult to then react to the, those changes in the landscape because you can lose and gain all the habitat quite quickly. Um, so if we are to monitor progress towards our 10%, Target, it would be useful to have this satellite based way to measure habitat cover too, which we could, we could do that on a probably an annual basis. So it would complement this national habitat map system that's been developed. So we hope that our national habitats, that there's the satellite based way of measuring habitats would, would sit along this, uh, this kind of national habitat uh, uh, map. So once we have a habitat map of the farm, say, what do we then do to get to our 10% cover? So again, this is Shinnok farm here, and we can see that over 80% of the farm is this um, improved agricultural grassland, as you'd expect. And again, the kind of method that you would employ when you're, you're, you're trying to get to a 10% cover is that an ecologist goes out, maps the farm, and then makes you know, specific recommendations to the farmer on how to get to 10% uh, based on that specific farm. However, again, that's a very onerous process. It takes a lot of time to employ a lot of people to do that. So what I'm wondering is that can we automate that system? Can we build, it's, it wouldn't be a fully automated system, but can we automate some of this, the recommendations that you create uh, when, when, you're, when you have a habitat map of the farm? So I just want to run through some of the recommendations that I've created for Shinnok Farm and then comment on how easy it would be to automate that. So the total habitat on the farm is, is this 9%. There's our 10% target, that red line. 
So the total habitat is around 9% and the total natural habitat is around 7%. Now, the difference between those two figures is that we have this conifer woodland and Sitka tree line on the farm. And let's show you an image here, that's the Sitka tree line. And these, these kind of conifer woodlands are very easy to pick out using satellite imagery. Um, the kind of coniferous leaves, you can pick them out very easily using infrared satellite imagery. Um, so if we detect, you know, these kind of non-native species on dairy uh, farms, it could be an easy automated recommendation to, okay, if when that, when those trees, when you either cut them down or they fall over naturally, replace them with natural forest, and then that can be included in your high diversity landscape feature uh, cover. So that will count toward the 10% target. So that's pr pretty easy, easily automatable recommendation. And then there's the natural grassland category, so 0.4% currently on the farm. And a lot of the farm has these kind of mown lawn areas. So in front of the in front of the parlor, you can see Alejandro here is standing on, on the mown lawn. And you know, if we can detect these, these lawn areas using the natural habitat map images again that's a pretty easily automatable uh, uh recommendation is to you know allow some of that mon lawn area to become some kind of natural wildflower meadow or just let it grow into uh, semi-natural grassland and again you're not compromising on production of the dairy farm specifically so this is the, all these measures so far are not compromising on the dairy system um so you try and look for win-win scenarios so again this is you know if we can detect these mon lawn areas we should be able to uh, you know, it's an easily automatical recommendation. Create some uh, not, uh, same natural grass in there. And similarly with hedgerows. So hedgerows are the dominant habitat in the farm, 3.41% uh, of the whole farm. And this is a nice hedgerow on Chinook Farm. But again, if you want to increase the habitat cover to that 10% target, a thing you could do is pull the fence out two meters on all the south facing hedges, say. Um, and by doing that, so we can measure all the hedgerows, obviously, we map them. So we just pull out the, 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 the hedge two meters to allow this grassland to grow. And you can measure the area size of that. And that will increase the amount of grassland, natural grassland that we have. And then that will increase the total habitat area. And we might yet, yet have got to our 10% cover. Uh, and so one last thing that we have, we could do is look for pastures. If we do need to convert over a pasture, if, if, if you know, this is the worst case scenario, but if we do have to convert over a pasture to, um, uh, some kind of natural habitat cover. What we do is look for the least productive pasture uh, that exists on the farm. So in Shannock, this, this pasture down here in the bottom left is kind of a parkland landscape. There's a lot of trees growing in it already, and it's also at the bottom of a hill, so it's constantly reverting back to kind of scrubby vegetation. And the farm managers tell me the cattle don't really like grazing in there, and they only graze in there, maybe, you know, it, it, they graze out very quickly. Um, so, you know, it's the least productive field in the whole farm. And again, we can probably detect that using satellite imagery using some kind of NDBI index. So if we had to, that'd be a, assist, that'd be a recommendation we could make. If you had to convert some over, uh, pass her over to uh, a satellite, uh, uh, sorry, over to natural habitat, that could be the, the pass you go for. And that would get us up to our 10% target. So the idea is, can we, can we take a lot of effort? Can we take a lot of the kind of, you know, uh, man, man hours that would require to implement this target. We automate a lot of that. We use the satellite based system to measure habitat. And then similarly, can we build an automated recommendation system to you know, help farmers get to that 10% target um, uh, and to meet that EU Green Deal ambition. And there's a whole piece about monitoring progress there. So we could use kind of images uh, to monitor progress, like farmers take images of the bits of land that they converted over to you know, you know, make sure that, that that actually has happened. So that's a summary. There's a huge amount of EU policy moving at the moment because of this EU Green Deal. Uh, that's been translated into Irish policy. In response to that, Farm GOC is creating this farm satellite-based farmland mapping system. We're going to trial it. Uh, we're going to test how useful it is in the Irish context. And similarly, once we have, we then automate a bit of that recommendation system to take a lot of the kind of donkey work out of out of um, uh, trying to reach that target. So, any questions? I'd be happy to take. Thank you very much, Keen. You give it a, a very good uh, context to the whole uh, project as well, because uh, as you know, yes, there are. Uh, I suppose we are in a biodiversity emergency, as has been described, um, and climate emergency. So. So these responses are, are really important. Just if I could start with you, Keen, and maybe Gavin, if you could join us also, maybe I uh, 
did switch off your video, Kevin, so it might, might have been having problems accessing it there. Um, and Pat, will you get Pat back as well, just to make sure that we have everybody. Uh, so, um, so Kian, yes, just in terms of the, the habitat uh, quality, uh, I didn't see mention of that in your presentation. It was is is largely a quantitative uh, assessment of of of, of habitat. Um, surely there are differences there between a a tree line of Sitka or um, conifers versus uh, native woodland. Or um, and, and and just to follow on to that, then is, is there any difference in terms of uh, having a a cluster? Of, of habitat as opposed to little different pieces of habitat scattered around a farm? Yeah, so good question. So there's the Sitka tree line would be just a different habitat, really. You know, that wouldn't count towards the high-diversity landscape feature. So that doesn't really come into the quality of a habitat so much. It's just a different habitat category, really. Um, so if you talk about habitat quality, you could be talking about a hedgerows with, you know, lots of different, a hedgerow with two meters high, with a lot of like, and it's full. Mm -hmm. uh, with like different layers to it. So it's got the grassland layer, the scrub layer, maybe some trees too. That's a high quality hedgerow uh, versus one with many gaps in it and you know just is you know doesn't have those layers of vegetation. So that is something that we're absolutely looking at. Uh, the quality of a hedgerow of, of all habitats matters massively. Um, we are going to try, we're going like there's a whole piece on habitat quality I didn't talk about it there. Um, we're going to try and measure you know habitat quality as much as we can again remotely. Um, is there ways, is, is there measures that we can that correlate some satellite space measures that correlate with habitat quality? You would, you would guess that a lot of measures would correlate with just kind of the size and age of a hedgerow. So if that hedgerow has been there a long time, it's going to be more biodiverse than one that's been just there recently. And if it's wider, you know, that's going to be a, a good in, indicator of quality too compared to a much thinner hedgerow. So these are some measures that we can measure remotely. We won't be able to get down to species level just using remote measures, but it's possible that, and this is something that I would love to really look into, you know, if there's, if, if we have a system where a farmer can take a picture of a hedgerow uh, and then upload that to a system, can we use some kind of analysis to look at, you know, the various different hedgerow that, that are shown in that picture to have some kind of quality assessment coming out of that. Uh, so that's something that that's, you know, in, in the project we're going to look at. And there's possibility that down the road, you know, like the new, the new iPhone has this LiDAR assessment on it. They have a LiDAR measure on it. So you could go and, you know, a farmer could walk down a hedgerow and, you know, take a, a 3D kind of image using this LiDAR of, of a hedgerow. And that's a huge amount of information contained in that uh, that we could analyze and, and get quality metrics out of. Um, so I think we, 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 I want to look at that in terms of definitely for the, the hab quality, habitat of, uh, sorry, habitat quality of hedgerows because they're such a dominant feature in the Irish landscape. Um, whether that'll be useful for other types of uh, habitat quality measures, I'm not sure. You know, you, you have a different habitat quality scorecard for your hedgerow versus your your semi-natural grassland versus your earth bank. So these are all these are all questions that we're looking into, definitely. Um, okay, thanks, thanks, Keen. Um, and just uh, Gavin, you spoke. Uh, about the, the the carbon side of the, the equation, um, and we had David Stiles speaking to us last week uh, about uh, the, the the carbon uh, emissions from from agriculture. Um, he he boiled it down to a very simple equation. He was talking about well, look, we can we can uh, reduce emissions by increased efficiency or reducing the total uh, output, uh, be it by cow numbers. But he also talked about the sequestration side of the equation. Then, um, could you tell us more a little bit more about the the how how the offsetting or that that offsetting of the the emissions uh, will take place on on the uh, the Chinook farm? Yeah, Mark. Um, yeah, I suppose it's so I could, soil carbon sequestration is I suppose a widely talked about topic at the moment. It's quite difficult to to measure and measure it. Um, so what we're doing with Schnack, we are, we're trying to reduce our emissions as much as possible. And then we're looking to offset through carbon sequestration, soil carbon sequestration, and looking to displace as well using the grassland by, by refinery. So we're not exactly sure how much we can displace using um, the soil carbon sequestration. That's just unknown at the moment. It could vary. Um, I've seen Chagas figures of 500 kgs of um, carbon per hectare. I've seen it 
um, over a ton. It could even be less. Is it a source? Is it a sink? It's quite difficult to, to know at the moment, but um, we that's what we're basically looking into at the moment. Okay. And are you factoring that into your projections around? Correct. The, yes. The, so we're factoring the, that in, in order to, to displace it and to get the uh, climate neutrality by 2027, we're going to have to look at uh, soil carbon sequestration. Yes. Okay, so so I'm just looking at that that graph you have there. So 2027, you're you're looking at, at neutrality there. So the, those so the the emissions then. Could you just remind me what those emissions will be offset by then? What what would those emissions be offset by? What what will be the so the emissions from the farm? What what will be the key offsets then for any residual emissions from the farm? It would be soil carbon sequestration and the use of the grass and bio refinery to displace uh, soil production. Okay, okay, very good, very good. I'm conscious we have a lot of questions coming in here, a lot of interest in in the, this particular project. So, uh, Pat, we probably should skip straight to the questions. Yeah, no, the, uh, I suppose that one of the key questions coming in it relates to the the methane element and. Uh, a comment kind of indicating that you haven't given a, a vision as to how you're going to, to pull down that, that uh, or, or uh, uh, mitigate that, that piece. Yeah, I suppose that's the biggest challenge for, for livestock systems. Um, I mentioned in my presentation that we're looking at um, methane reducing additives. So we're Lawrence Lewis part of the project as well. So he's currently doing trials. There's some very promising methane additives out there. I know there's um, Asparagopsis, the red seaweed, is probably the most interesting out there. They're seeing reductions of up to 80 to 90 percent um, in indoor systems abroad. So the likes of New Zealand, Australia, America. So there's trials being carried out on that. Um, so we're hoping to get a trial up and running, but Lawrence should do more practice to look at that in the grass-based system. So there is quite promising out like as I said, 80 to 90 percent reduction. There's also um Trinop, um, which is a DSM product, and um, they're seeing reductions of about 30 to 40 percent. Um, but look, it, it is a challenge. It is a massive challenge. It's over half our carbon footprint. So that's what I would say. The biggest challenge for reducing our carbon footprint will be methane, yes. Question here, very practical one. Uh, is is Chinook Farm a profit-making farm at the moment? And uh, will it continue to be profit-making as you heard, head to uh, 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 net carbon zero in 2027? And what economic challenges do you, do you expect in getting to carbon zero? Yeah, I suppose, I think... Um, I have a farming background, so I think we need to be very practical. Like we want to create an economically viable climate neutral, so it needs to be economically viable. Um, there will be challenges, definitely. Schlack is a very, very profitable farm, which is, is a credit to Kevin Horn and Al Murphy and um, the management staff. About common profit per hectare is about two and a half thousand euro per hectare, so extremely profitable. Um, there will be a lot of challenges um, going forward, but would say the likes of, I think cost will be like. What would be the cost of a methane reducing additive? Um, would it be how expensive would these are? Would say um, your slurry amendments and on all, all this technology that would definitely factor into it. But um, we will be looking at the economic side that we're creating a, um, a business plan or farm innovation blueprint to look at that. Uh, question for Keen in relation to the, uh, uh, the I suppose the impact of the habitats as well as just the the, the habitats being there. Uh, is there any measuring uh, planned in relation to impact on, on uh, pollinators, other species, birds? And I suppose the other part of that question uh, relates to the, uh, uh, I suppose, the, the ensuring uh, that there is food for, for uh, particularly pollinators right throughout the year, which is something that Jane Stout kind of dealt with, with as, uh, as a hugely important issue in, in, when she had a, a webinar earlier. Yeah, so I have done uh, kind of species level assessments of all the habitats on Shinnok Farm. That's not a particularly a part of the project. We're not going to look at all the species, you know, at all the habitats and all the farms we're looking at. We're more concerned about this habitat level assessment, given that this target is coming in from the EU level. We want to create a system that can measure that and then how you get to that 10% target if you implement that. The, you know, if you have a diversity of habitats on your farm, so that, that, that would be correlated with whether you have, you know, lots of different habitat groups and species diversity in the farm too. So your hedgerows will have a specific community, grassland, semi-natural grassland areas. So, you know, you could infer some species level uh, kind of, you know, populations uh, from the habitat richness and diversity on the farm. 
Okay, and I suppose the other part of that, is there any thought of, uh, uh, in, in terms of the continuity of ha habitats across the landscape? Yes, yeah, sorry, and Mark actually asked me that. Uh, yeah, so part of this system that we would like to build, the recommendation system, is obviously there, like, uh, you know, a forestry, you know, natural forestry beside other, you know, already there forest. So if you have some ancient forest on the, on the, on the farm, it'd be great to, you know, add on to that with some other forestry. So there's these kind of like ecological conservation principles that you would integrate into that assessment system, uh, recommendation system that would, you know, get your most bang for your buck from a biodiversity perspective. Uh, in terms of creating more uh, you know, species riches in the in the landscape and reduce those declines, um, we, we you know we I would also like to look at a higher level of the farm than the farm scale at the whole landscape. Um, that's not you know specifically written into the project, but it might be something we look at. But at the moment, we're going to focus at the farm scale. Okay, there's quite uh, uh, for Gavin. There's quite a few questions in relation to uh, uh, technologies, anaerobic digestion. Uh, 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 photo PV and a potential role, and also a good few questions around the the uh, uh, the use of the the grass and the grass protein from uh, uh, biorefinery. Yeah, so we have um, we have a renewal plan in place. So there was a windmill installed on the farm in 2011. We are looking to install solar PV as well. So that will be installed um, in the coming year. Um, that will all um, tie into place and looking to reduce our carbon or CO2 emissions. It's a small fraction of, um, of our overall emissions, but we still need to reduce it. Um, looking at the grass and biorefinery, I know James Gaffey from NTU is doing a presentation on it next week, so um, I won't go into too much detail. So but what it basically is, um, you're, you put grass into this grass biorefinery, it looks basically like grass has gone for silage, it's gone strong, you put it in, you get a liquid fraction, and you also get a solid fraction, which basically looks like um, lawn cuttings. That solid fraction, there was trials done in UCD in the Marusi Tech machine. Um, so they saw a 10 to 15% reduction in that compared to grass silage. They also did trials in milking cows. So they did grass silage, grass protein, can or the whey um, fraction, or the press cake, sorry, and concentrate. And then just comparing that to grass silage and concentrate. So they saw very, very little difference in milk yield. Um, so that was quite promising. Um, and I know there's more trials going on in that um, with methane in Moore Park as well. Um, in the coming year. So that's quite interesting. And what you're getting from that as well, you're getting the liquid fraction and that's trying to um, a protein concentrate, which is looking to displace soya production. Um, so James will go into this in more detail next week, but there was basically a trial done on that last year uh, in Barry Row um, on a pig farm. So basically it was used as part of the diet to displace soya um, and looked at finishers and there was a very little difference in growth rates um, in, in, in that um, Trail, but there'll be more trails happening as well in it. But it's 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 very promising. Okay, there's a question yeah. in relation to to reseeding uh, for clover and multi-species sward, and and what is your plan at this point? You have a a ten percent multi-species sward. You have significant clover, I think you said in in a lot of the rest of the the, the pasture. What's mm -hmm. your view going forward? I suppose of the relative merits between a clover sward and a multi-species sward. Yeah, I suppose um, ten percent of the farm is already in the multi-species mix, which is chicory, plantain, um, perennial ryegrass, and clover. The aim is to get the majority of the farm. Ideally, we want a hundred percent farm um, with clover in the sport. Um, but our, our target is seventy-five percent, but the more the better, basically. So we want to reduce our chemical in um, to about one hundred and fifty kgs per hectare. Um, it's going to be quite challenging, as I suppose anybody that's tried clover before. Um, it's not. It, it's, it's not easy. So we're basically looking to include clover in a full reseed, but we're also looking to over sow pallets as well. So anybody familiar with it, basically you, you can't over sow the whole farm in one year because just the management practices, um, grazing tight and trying to get into the cover of um, 1,000, maybe 1,100 um, and reducing chemical in to give the, give the clover a chance. So the plan over next year is to include in the full reseed and to over sow, and we will be sowing more multi-species as well. Kevin, can I can I ask you a question just in relation to sort of the, the scaling of this the, um, the 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 different aspects of this farm if we were to scale it to a national level? You know, what sort of supports do you think would be needed there to support farmers implementing these types of measures uh, at at a farm level, uh, so that we can actually try and because there's so, so, so much good stuff happening here at, at, at uh, on the farm here in Shinnock. Yeah, I suppose the, the first step really, Mark, is to 
is to show that it works on farm and which we're doing so I suppose just from the research like there's I think there's absolutely some fantastic work going on um in more park as well with reducing like methane is a biggest challenge I think funding um just to get that research up and going and to prove it um is the is the most important thing I suppose going to the farm level then I suppose something like the signpost series the signpost farmers I think more funding towards that is fantastic um Carberry have their joint program um which has been running for the last number of years and run by Jan McNamara so we're we're leasing and working with those farmers very closely we have 10 monitor farms so we were we would call them our, our replicator farms as well. So we're keeping them very close to the project. <coughs> and so I think for farmers and coming from a farming background, I think if they can see it's working, I think investment in that, if they can see it's working on farm level um, and demonstration farms in Shinnok, um, I think that's that, that's yes. the way forward in, in my in, in my belief. But look, I suppose, um, as Keen was mentioned with the, with the biodiversity, the increase of biodiversity, like we are in a biodiversity crisis, I suppose increased payments and um, and I suppose you, you might elaborate on that as well, Akeem, with, with yeah. policy and... Yeah, I'd like to, yeah. So, you know, when, I, when, it, when you talk to farmers on the ground, one of the really, you know, perverse policy uh, kind of on the ground is that when a farmer converts a bit of land over to some uh, biodiversity from the productive pastures, that they lose basic farm payment. So that's, you know, you're, you're penalising farmers to get to that 10% at the moment. With the current cap reform, there is a chance for Ireland to pay farmers. There's a, there's a in the eco schemes, there's a policy that you can pay farmers to have natural habitat on the farm. So I'd love to see a policy where if you know to get that 10% target, you pay for that, you know, land, that, that biodiversity land. So you convert whatever whatever land is converted over uh, from the basic farm payments, from the productive land to that, the biodiversity land, you don't lose out in the the basic farm payment or even you're maybe you know paid a little bit more than the basic farm payment for that biodiversity land so that would really get rid of the kind of perverse policy incentives at the moment and i think would lead to a lot more uptake of this 10 percent target could i just just ask uh, gavin there I, i've met uh, met some farmers over the years and they they they, they feel they're they're the ones that are becoming the endangered species at, at times um are you looking at the sort of broader sustainability aspects of, of the farm in terms of the social sustainability? I mean, is it going to be practical for a, a one or two person operation to implement all of these measures? And, you know, what are the impacts of this, like the zero in 2027? What will the, the profitability of the farm look like um, given, okay, so efficiency is going to bring us so far, but then there are going to be other measures then. I, I presume you're looking at the, the value streams coming from those other uh, aspects that you, you've talked about but just I'm just interested in the, the kind of the social sustainability and even boiling it down to farmer well-being and so forth yeah it does look I suppose that's where we're taking a holistic approach um looking at it um and it does need to be and I suppose we, we need to stay grounded this needs to be practical um it's no point going down a very expensive route or going down something that's that's not practical because it needs to be implemented by farmers and farmers in the ground um I suppose just look at the social sustainability side of it. Um, like Schnock Farm is a, like um, it's a very very well run farm. Um, just from like a labour point of view, there's no point um going into too much. We don't want to draw too much work on farmers either. Um, and I suppose we'll be demonstrating this as we go forward as well. Um, like um, the holistic approach is looking at biodiversity. It's looking at water quality. It's looking at air quality. And I suppose the stuff like labour is going to be factored into. But it does. Um, I suppose at the end of the day, it needs it needs the support. Um farm our families basically hmm. but the, the the so the farm itself is is managed by a, a team is that right if it's correct managed. so there's two full-time neighbors would say kevin horn and um alan murphy okay very good very good um i i i, I won't interject too much more because i know there's just two, lots of questions coming through here so we've only a few minutes left so um yeah, I suppose a, a question there in relation to uh, uh, trying to our actions to try and reduce losses of, of nitrogen to water. Is there anything going on in the farm to, to try and, and uh, minimize losses? Yeah, so we're at the early stages of this. Um, I, I suppose um, we're working very closely with Aoife Feeney and Carver, who's an asset advisor. So she did an asset assessment um, on the farm and those, um, she basically created an, an asset report um, and those actions were um were taken on board and they were delivered um i suppose very very practical things as well there is a weather station above in Shinnok, so there's a, um, that gives us um soil temperatures 
just simple stuff like look at the soil temperature of that station, not spreading fertilizer when the grass isn't growing, look at the soil temperature, look at the forecast, we're looking at low emission slurry spreading, we're looking to reduce um, reduce our chemical in as well. Um, there will be, as part of the signpost, so, um, just to say that Chinock is also a signpost farm, so as part of that, they're doing a law pro study as well. So we're looking at areas, this will give us a more in-depth um, analysis and we'll be able to see where the possible areas um, are a risk of, of, of runoff. And um, so I think Keen, we were kind of chatting about that actually last week about that, and maybe possibly looking into that more, I suppose we're at the very early stages, but looking into more, maybe planting or pulling out the hedgerows a bit more in those areas and um, after, after looking at that study. Yeah, just, just comment on that briefly. Um, for, the, for phosphorus runoff, you can you know, use these kind of habitat features to try and mitigate, to close the gaps, the kind of runoff uh, areas. Um, for nitrogen, it's harder because it's actually groundwater, but we will be using like the pollution impact potential maps that EPA produced. And we actually might try and model those at a farm scale to give more actual insights to farmers particularly around using hedgerows uh, or other landscape features to mitigate runoff of phosphorus. Nitrogen is much more about kind of source reduction than, um, than, than trying to actually, you know, trap it in kind of habitats. There's a question here uh, uh, saying you've, you've uh, at this stage had quite a number of farmers coming in around the place and talk, talking to them and just to try and get a sense of some of the technologies and issues that they seem to be willing to go with or that they're pushing back against and, and some insight into that maybe, Gavin? Yeah, look, I suppose we're at the very, very early stages of the project. Um, I think there has been a lot of farmers out and there's been a lot of um, discussion groups out. I think the general consensus, it's very, very positive. Farmers are willing to change. Um, they're willing to adapt this technology. They just want to see it in place. And again, as I said, it needs to be practical. And I suppose we need to keep that in the back of our mind. I suppose, again, I'm from a farming background and I always think in the back of my head, if, this is, if I couldn't take this back to my own farm or my uncle's farm, it, it's not going to work. So I think um, they've been very positive to, to, to all of them. Um, obviously, there's going to be a small bit of feedback um, and questions and some of the aspects, but um, as a general overview, it, it, it's quite positive. When I was out on the replicator farm, Slurry spreading was a very popular technology. Um, also, there was some issue around, you know, clover management, and there was a lot of interest in clove max. I think his name was that that uh, the pesticide, the herbicide that you know doesn't impact clover. Um, and you know, if if that could be, you know, integrated more into the farming system, what was un unavailable that would affect a lot of clover management strategies. So I think that'd be useful to have. Uh, more available, uh, and that would increase a lot of the clover uptake because there's a concern around clover management at the moment. Yeah. There, 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 there's a question in here, uh, kind of alluding to a, an impression there that the pressure is coming entirely on farmers uh, to resolve this issue, uh, and to what extent are others within the the value chain uh, uh, doing their bit, uh, and how is that being reflected in this project and other things that you're seeing? Yeah, well, I suppose this is a this is a dear like it, it's a farming project, it's an agricultural project. I suppose um, just looking to Carberry as well, like they're they're in the value added chain. They're looking to um, they're looking to reduce their emissions as well. So they have a plan in place and that. But I suppose I can't I can't really comment for for anybody else. We're looking at the, the agricultural side. I do, yeah, I do agree. Sometimes farmers do get the the brunt of it, which is unfair. Yeah, I would love to see. Sorry, sorry, just a, just a question in relation to. Um, uh, the ammonia um, side of things, uh, because that that is another big issue for Ireland. Um, we have serious uh, uh, risk of overshooting our targets in relation to ammonia, um, and uh, obviously agriculture is one of the, the main sources of ammonia emissions. Uh, have, have you measures in place to address that, or do you you see a, a zero uh, ammonia situation arising on the farm, or is that a target within the project? It's quite, we're looking to reduce um, ammonia emissions. It's quite difficult to monitor, monitor ammonia emissions on an ind individual farm basis. So simple technologies like, I suppose, protected urea compared to standard urea. So protected urea has a lower um, ammonia emission factor as well. Um, low emission slurry spreading, less ammonia off that as well. Um, 
and we're looking at um i suppose we have a trial in place this year that's looking at reducing methane from stored um slurry so we're, we're also possibly looking at the, the potential of, to, to measure the ammonia emissions off that as well and see if we could reduce reduce that but um we have we are reducing our ammonia emissions but um that we'll have to look into further in the future as well okay because there is a, i know that there's always always a risk when we look at all of the, the the key areas of you know soil quality, water quality, climate that that you there's a risk of pollution swapping. You know that you'll chase after mm -hmm. one particular target and uh, the others suffer as a result. Um, are the, the what in terms of water quality, what sort of measures are you implementing on the farm? Or is, is that part? Yeah, of I suppose I, I probably I probably mentioned a couple of just like some very very simple practical things that Key mentioned as well about your hedgerows and um, spreading spreading fertilizer. Um, as far as common sense, look at the the weather station if you would say that. I suppose monitoring water quality in the farm. We're looking at that as well. It's quite difficult to measure water quality on the farm, so we're looking at the possibility of similar possibility of suction cups. Um, but we just need to be uh, practical as well. But um, yeah. Sorry, no, I'd, I'd missed that. Now, apologies if you had covered that already. Okay, pass. A, a, a question in relation to, uh, I suppose, two elements of, of, of soil. One is, is your overall soil fertility and the, the stats in relation to, to where your soil fertility is at. And the second one in relation to the uh, measurement of the organic matter in your soils, where are they at and, and where do you hope to get them to over a period? Yeah, um, I suppose that's managed by uh, John McNamara and Kevin Hurd, so I don't actually have those figures, but the um, the soil fertility status is, is quite good in the farm, um, but I don't have the exact figures behind it. Um, looking at that as well, the soil organic matter, we don't have the, a, a target, we have a baseline. Um, what those what those figures are off the top of my head, I, I don't know. But we'll be looking to, like we need to, the plan is to, to measure, um, looking at soil carbon over the next couple of years, we're doing the zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30 centimetres um, sampling for carbon um, over the next couple of years. But what the baseline is exactly, I, I don't have those figures off the top of my head, unfortunately. And other than, uh, I suppose, in the system, as you move towards a, a, a more carbon neutrality, uh, there's certain fertilizer, certain costs are increasing, like dramatic increases in, in, in fertilizer costs at, at the moment. Is the overall objective to reduce, maintain or see slight increases in the cost of production of, of, of milk? Is it a, a kind of a win-win that by moving towards a, a net zero that you will actually reduce the cost of production or is it going to cost to, to do that? Yeah, look, I suppose we, we looked at we looked at some of this and some of the practice that you can take on will save money, like the clover, if you can incorporate clover into the sword and have an average of 25 to 27% over the year, you're going to reduce your nitrogen bill and you'll also see an increase in um, milk solids. So something like that is, is going to is going to increase um, low emission slurry spreading, um, gaining about an extra three units of nitrogen per thousand gallons. That's going to um, reduce your costs. So there's a couple of those. Um, like I know the multi-species war as well. We're seeing significantly um, less fertilizer going onto those as well. So that's all, and with similar um, tons of dry matter. So like, that's all going to reduce our costs going forward. Obviously, there's going to be. Um, a couple of more costs associated as well, but um, overall, we want we do want to reduce costs and keep, as I said, it needs to be economically viable for farmers. We will be creating this innovation blueprint where we'll be able to compare and contrast all the different measures that you would potentially implant on your farm and see what the cost and benefit of each and in combination of all those measures. So you should, should be able to compare if you want to implant anything on your farm, what would be the cost? Okay. Uh, maybe a final question for, for Keen. Uh, are you tracking soil health and uh, soil biodiversity in any way? Uh, not specifically. We're, we'll be just measuring the kind of carbon uh, sequestration in soil on the baselines. Uh, we won't be doing like soil biodiversity samples or anything. We might look at, you know, because in, in multi species words, you expect to have kind of more soil biodiversity than in your conventional words. We might look at that. It's not written into the work package, but it'd be something I'd be interested in regardless. But it, um, we're not specifically looking at that in, in this project. Okay, my finish with a comment there. There's a, a comment well done to all involved in this morning's presentation. It's heartening to see two young people coming up with realistic concrete solutions uh, to our biodiversity situation. So I think, uh, and, and a number of, of, of uh, uh, comments of that kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just want to echo that. Um, it's, it's great to see 
you know, that this level of, of, of detail going into the work look and the look acknowledges that there's work to be done in agriculture, um, but uh, people are taking it seriously. So well done to, to both of you for, for uh, getting, getting stuck into to this project. Um, I just before we, we, we leave you, I just want to share details with you of uh, Bioeconomy Ireland Week next week. It runs from the 18th uh, to the 24th of October. And um, so if you don't know a lot about bi the bioeconomy, uh, maybe you'd like to log into a few of the events, um, you can go to uh, irishbioeconomy.ucd.ie uh, where you can learn more uh, from Bioeconomy Ireland there. So uh, I do encourage you to, to look, check out some of the uh, the events and the um, uh, the presentations that are going to be uh, happening next week. And uh, next week, we're going to be actually, as part of uh, Bioeconomy Week, we will have a presentation looking at the, um, uh, the bioeconomy. We're going to have uh, James uh, Gaffey from uh, MTU. Uh, we're going to have, who else are we having? Um, uh, at all the names there. Johan Sanders. Johan Sanders, that's right. And we had Xavier Dubuisson. Um, all speaking about biorefinery glass and the potential of bioeconomy to transform grassland agriculture in Ireland. So that's next Friday at 9.30. So uh, again, thanks to Kim and uh, Gavin for, for joining us this morning. Really enjoy your presentation. And the presentation will be available on the Chagas website in the next coming days. And uh, final thanks to uh, Vaughan Maher in, in the background, helping us uh, with the production and, and today's uh, episode, and also Andy Boland, our series producer as well. So until next week, uh, have a good weekend, and uh, we will chat to you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.